Thank you for auditing the Always Positive New Music Review Show, hosted by a French professor who will eventually get to a review of the new album, Atang Atang by Glorilla, and where I'll talk about its great usage of crunk aesthetics, how it has one of the best tracks of the year, the unintentional Romeo and Juliet song. But what I'm really focused on is language and the way that she uses language. And you can tell by my title. Glorilla versus the English language, that um, I'm being provocative. Uh, that sounds, as far as the title goes, very snobby, very classist, potentially sexist, most certainly racist. But please understand, I'm using that title provocatively because I believe the opposite. I don't think this is a question of Glorilla versus the English language, but I think the way that she uses it is informative about Southern rap, about rap itself and about the position, uh, the, the relationship between rap and the English language. Her extreme deformation of many words I find to be fascinating, and as someone who studies languages as a living, I thought I should give some care to it. My thesis is that she expands the language and its capabilities. She expands it. It's more playful. It's more interesting. It demands more respect. You can tell that just by the title, which I struggle to pronounce. E-H-H-H-T-H-A-N-G to be pronounced A-Tang, right? A-Tang. I don't know. I can't pronounce it that way. I am none of the things that she is. I am not a black female from the South under the age of 30, okay? I am absolutely none of those things. But part of what makes rap so fascinating for linguists is its position in between written speech and spoken speech. Written language and spoken language. I should have said that. That sounds a lot more intelligent. Sorry, it's been a long day. I've had a bunch of bad meetings. That's what makes rap special, is that it's not like many other forms of, of poetry or of writing that's trying to be as far away from everyday speech but it's also not just everyday speech because it has to rhyme and it is artistic. It exists right in that little middle space between them. Therefore, the language that they represent is usually representative of something, either their aspirations to be poetic, either their desire to represent how, how they speak in their daily life. And what ends up happening is we have a lot of English in rap music and especially in Southern rap music, which deviates from standard English. If you hear the word standard English, you should have a little bell going around the back of your head. Woo, woo, colonialism alert, colonialism alert. It makes sense because standard English implies there is some kind of centralized, proper English. So then what does that make the kind of English that is used on the Glorilla album? We might call it a dialect. A simple definition of dialect is a form of language which is peculiar to a specific region or social group. I think in this case we could say African Americans from the city of Memphis. The term vernacular is a little bit more specific because it's the language and, or dialect spoken by the ordinary people. So based on watching interviews with her and studying her music, I think this is more of a question of a vernacular. Again, what makes this vernacular different from the English that I speak? I speak a largely, largely standard English. I might throw in, I might say crackers when I'm talking about crackers. Uh, I, you know, I might say Wednesday instead of Wednesday. I have a couple of weird Bostonianisms that I inherited from my dad. In general, my English is very, very standard. So her vernacular is Southern, specific to Memphis, young, black, and female. And traditionally, and when I say traditionally, I mean over the past several centuries, any standard language is created by people, usually in the north or wherever the dominant power center is in a country. In this case, it is the northeast. It is old, it is white, and it is male. And it's part of what makes this music, for me, as a someone from the northeast who's received a lot of education, who is white and male and increasingly closer to old than to young, uh, I, I can tell you that listening to her music and the way that she speaks presents a significant challenge to me because of its deviations from standard English. The term that the grammarians use when they talk about it is like, how should we determine what language is spoken? There's prescriptive grammar and descriptive grammar. So I'm fascinated by this difference. Uh, prescriptive grammar means 
There are rules and you do not break those rules. You determine what is in a, what is spoken by what some people in a room decide, what they write down in a book. To the contrary, descriptive writing, descriptive grammar is how people actually use the language. If I look back here, I don't have it because I have it back in my office, I mean back at my home. I study a lot about usage in the 17th century France because 17th century France is the time when the French language was really codified and when they really tried to have prescriptive grammar, yet there were still people who were applying principles of descriptive grammar to prescriptive grammar. Basically, what does it mean when people say things they shouldn't say according to prescriptive grammar? In my opinion, as a, a lover of language and a lover of life, that's where things get interesting. That's where my mind goes. What are those points? Whether it is my father referring to his sister, okay, as the following word, ma thur. That was what he called my aunt, ma thur. Her name was Martha, but he, as a Bostonian, took out the R from the middle of the name, as a Bostonian, hypercorrected, put an R at the end of the name, and completely deformed it. There is nothing inherent, there is nothing different, truly different, except for the giant power imbalance between Atang Atang and Aunt Mather. Fundamentally, it's the same basic idea of usage changing the language over time. And it was really this one line which I printed out behind me, which I didn't know what she was saying, so I wrote out what I heard. Manif Boifa Eba no versh. Manaf boifa eba. No versh. She says it twice. That's what drew my attention to it. She's like, You aren't listening to me. Let me say it again. Manaf boifa eba. No versh. <laughs> okay? That's what I heard. And all the way throughout this entire album, she really emphasizes this vernacular. Now, the way that I'm talking, you might think it's insufferably snobby, and I don't blame you. I'm intentionally playing that up. I could have recorded this at home in my undershirt, but I'm recording it in my three-piece suit in my office filled with many books. It smells of rich Corinthian leather, okay? I'm doing this on purpose to emphasize these power differences because the power of my voice, the power of the words that I learned in institutions, the power that was conveyed to me through education and through this training is a power of language. Her speaking like that is sometimes, quite often, used to keep people away from power. And that transcends, it's not always a question of race. The same thing will happen with a white southerner who speaks with a marked southern accent. It is a way of keeping them away from power, which is why when we have music, when we have culture that forces us to consider other vernaculars and treat them as seriously as we treat any others, something that is unabashedly proud of its vernacular, we need to study it. But let's stop listening. Let's stop listening to the white guy. Okay, let's have the white guy put on his glasses. Toby chewed up my glasses, so I look like a fool, but that's okay, because I'm going to be reading someone who most decidedly is not a fool. Okay, this is from July 29th, 1979, New York Times, James Baldwin. If I can say one thing about the whole civilization we got going here, you know how everything sucks and we're going to have Trump again and all that stuff? At least we live in a society that has had a James Baldwin moment. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Can we, can we give ourselves a little bit of credit for the fact that James Baldwin is now mostly known by most people with some level of education or understanding of social justice issues? Anyways, the great black thinker, James Baldwin, wrote this essay in 1979, 20 years before Glorilla was born, but I think it applies to how we interpret an album like Atang, Atang. If black English isn't a language, then tell me what is. He wrote this in France. He, was from, he lived in France. He's from America, but he lived in France. The argument concerning the use or the status or the reality of black English is rooted in American history. 
and has absolutely nothing to do with the question the argument supposes itself to be posing. The argument has nothing to do with language itself, but with the role of language. Language incontestably reveals the speaker. Language also, far more dubiously, is meant to define the other, and in this case, the other is refusing to be defined by a language that has never been able to recognize him. Can I break that down in the context of Glorilla okay? Do you understand? It reveals the speaker. Atang, atang. Manaf boy for eba. That identifies the speaker. And it is in her refusal to be defined by a language that has never recognized her. That is to say, the language of the powerful, white, educated, dominant, northern class. Okay? I'm going to skip. I'll include a link uh, in, in the description. Seriously, you got to read this whole thing. God damn. This reminds me, I need to read a lot more James Baldwin. He discusses France. France still clings to its ancient and... Uh, in the south of France, they still cling to the ancient and musical Provençal, which resists being described as a dialect. And much of the tension in the Basque countries and in Wales is due to Basque and Welsh determination to not allow their languages to be destroyed. So these are regional languages in Europe which refuse to be destroyed, and it's a sign of the oppressed people by centralizing forces who refuse to let go of their language later. It goes without saying, then, that language is also a political instrument, means, and proof of power. It is the most vivid and crucial key to identify. It reveals the private identity and connects one with, or divorces them from, the larger public or communal identity, which is to say, on an everyday basis, if you walk into the room and say, how is Atang going? You will be divorced from the larger public or communal identity. There have been and are at times and places when to speak a certain language can be dangerous, even fatal. He uses the example of language in England. What's, what he really points out super well is that in England, accents are such a clear indicator of, of status and place in a way that they aren't always in America. To open your mouth in England is, if I may use black English, to put your business in the street. You have confessed your parents, your youth, your school, your salary, your self-esteem, and alas, your future. If someone walks into the room and says, how is thing going? I would assume, to a certain extent, we would make these same kinds of assumptions. He then goes on, beautiful paragraph, I do not know what American what white American language would sound like if it had never seen any black people in the United States. It would suck. It would just be terrible. We just have the, we just have the crappiest language. He gives examples of words like jazz and funky. Uh, true fact, funk is my favorite word. Absolutely, it's my favorite word because it can't really be defined. So this is where he goes to explain black English because the whole idea is, right, he's, he's describing on the first part how power exists in the country and how those in power use standardized language, use prescriptive grammar. In other words, he doesn't use those words, I am. Use prescriptive grammar to marginalize others who do not speak that way and in particular he is speaking about black Americans who have an accent. I say that the present skirmish is rooted in American history, and it is. Black English is the creation of the black diaspora. Blacks came to the United States chained to each other but from different tribes. Neither could speak the other's language. If two black people at that bitter hour of the world's history had been able to speak to each other, the institution of chattel slavery could never have lasted as long as it did. God damn, I might cry that is such good writing. As he says later, a language comes into existence by means of brutal necessity, and the rules of language are dictated by what the language must convey. If black English is not, uh, if this journey does not indicate that black English is a language, I am curious to know by what definition language is to be trusted. A people at the center of the Western world and in the midst of so hostile a population has not endured and transcended by means of what is patronizingly called a dialect. Like I just did, when I just called it a dialect. I was being patronizing. The brutal truth is that the bulk of white people in America never had any interest in educating black people, except as, as, as this could serve white purposes. It is not the black child's language that is in question. It is not his language that is despised. 
It is his experience. Read the rest of that. That's better than this video. It's better than everything else on YouTube. It's even better than Mr. Beast giving $10,000 to somebody for uh, stubbing their toe, okay? It is not the black child's language that is in question. It is not his language that is despised. It is his experience. What James Baldwin is helping us to understand, take off these ridiculous glasses that Toby chewed up and I sat on, is that connection between the hatred and misunderstanding of black languages, of any language, of any oppressed minority, and the fact that the oppression that they have suffered is born through the language. We see the oppression, we feel the oppression through the language. And that discomfort that it creates leads us to hate that language, which is why even though when I saw eh tang, eh tang, the first thing I thought was, that's funny. The same way it's funny that my dad says mather, but it's also not funny. It's only funny that my dad says mather because he didn't come from an oppressed class. The, that, that language was just because of some part of England, wherever the hell my great, 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 great whatever's came from, right? It's amazing. It's amazing that we are able to have this music, which so often, has us confront the realities, linguistic realities, that most of our ancestors have tried to ignore. Now, I want to take this even broader, okay? We've talked about James Baldwin, who is a great figure who I think deserves respect. Do you know who else is a great figure who deserves respect? Shannon Sharp. I've been saying, before he had Club Shay Shay, that he is like maybe the best broadcaster in the country right now. Back when he was on that show, I would watch him talk about basketball when I wasn't even watching basketball. I would watch him talk about football. I don't really watch football. I think he's one of the most engaging, intelligent, insightful communicators that's out there. So when he did his interview show, I've got news for you. His interviews are some of the best, most interesting, educated, engaging, thoughtful interviews that exist. And he had an hour and a half interview with Glorilla. And it is beautiful. First of all, you get to see him drinking wine for the first time. That's interesting enough. But what's most interesting is, so while I'm, descri what talking about? While I'm describing these issues, right? While I'm discussing this and I'm, I'm putting it always through this, this lens of race, because obviously that's what James Baldwin is talking about. It also exists, <laughs> like this kind of hyper-specificity, this kind of language play exists within the black culture within the South. We're going to see somebody from rural Southern Georgia, incapable of understanding the language of somebody from Memphis, which if you're from the North, like I am, like aren't those right next to each other? They're not, but I mean like spiritually in my mind. So let's watch them talk about language, okay? I'm gonna do my thing where I <laughs> show you my dirty screen, okay? This is her discussing her music and his reaction. Is that yeah. the way you was kind of feeling? Yeah, and then you know me, I I don't respond a lot on the internet, so I just rather put it in my music. Okay. And that was just it. What what you just say? What you gonna put it in? <laughs> my music. <laughs> yeah, what that is? <laughs> Okay, there's just so much as a linguist, right? Because she says in it, so she doesn't pronounce the R on internet, and then she does put an R in music, which is something vernacular of Memphis. And then he doesn't understand, he's asking for under, and what I love about this, what I love about Shannon Sharp is he's never judgmental. When he, people speak, he, he has that skill of listening and not judging, but also drawing attention to something he does not understand. The conversation continues. M music? That's right. What I, it, it would take so much for me to say, to, say it right. Uh, okay. Oh, my God. It would take so much for me to say it right. This is the thing. Glorilla, if we are agreeing to descriptive grammar rules, if we are to understand what Langston... What, no, Langston sorry, I have Langston Hughes in the background because he was uh, one of the first poets to write in, a, in, a, in black dialects and make sure that it was respected as poetry. Right? He basically did what Joachim de Duvalet did in France five centuries earlier. Long story. She's admitting defeat by saying, I can't say it correct. And that's the question. Is there a proper way to say music? Is Merzik the wrong way to say music? I think the only way we can say it's the wrong way to say music is if we accept 
that there is a right way. And if there is a right way, 99 out of 10 times, that is culturally the white way. Anyways, let's watch. That was too cute, the rhyme, but I think it actually holds up. Oh. I know how to, I can't say it right, but it would take so much. So that's, that's a Memphis thing? Mm-hmm. We put, we tend to put R's out in words that got you in the middle. Oh, music. Mm hmm And Cuban. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we, so have, have you always been like that? So this has been this way since you were a little girl. How we talk? Yeah. Go to Memphis, you're gonna see everybody talk just like me. Wow. So did when you started when you started in this business, did they try to get you to change like how you talk? Because I mean, obviously, like different languages, you can say, and it sounds the same. Mm -hmm. But the way you talk and the way you sing and the way it sounds <laughs> is entirely. How, how you able to do that? So like you feel like I'm country as hell. Like a corn cob in our house. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. I'm from rural South Georgia, so I'm like that also. Yeah. And I went to, like, when I first got in television, I went to classes. I went to path speech pathologist, and I went to everybody. Try speech pathologist, right? Just do you see how connected power and language are? Speech pathologist. She doesn't have a pathology. She has an accent. Jesus. <laughs> and to change. But at the end of the day, I was about to change who I am. Mm -hmm. This country slang in which, not slang, but the country, countryism in which I have, this colloquial dialect, that's who I am. Exactly. You, that's who you are. That's what makes you glow. Mm-hmm. But, like, people weren't trying to get me to change it. Like, it was just really people, me finding out that people love how Memphis people talk, because I had never knew we had an accent ever until, like, I blew up and started going into other cities. Yeah. Like, I never knew. I really thought we talked normal as right. hell. And so once I started doing interviews... Just so much right there. I never knew I had an accent. And that's the great thing. You sitting at home, you have an accent. You do. You have an accent. You don't know you have an accent. You don't know you have an accent until you get out of your socio-political area. That's part of the reason why it's so important to travel, to see there is no no accent. There is no real standard. Standard is a lie created by people with power. Shh. Don't tell anybody else in the Illuminati. I promised them I'd never tell them the secrets of the academia. I first blew up in there, but I'm like, oh my God, she's so country. And like, they got an accent, the accent's so strong. I'm like, damn, this is this everyday talking. Right. Is, like, this is how we talk. Well, when you around everybody that sound like you, that's that, that's normal until you get outside. You're like, well, damn, what the hell y'all talking exactly. about? Exactly. <laughs> they be making me feel like I speak right. like uh, Spanish or something. So the new album. Everything, everything, but is it everything, everything, or everything, everything? It's everything, everything, no R's. No R's. Nah. Everything, everything. Everything, everything. <laughs> so how do you come up with that time? Okay, so watch the rest of the interview. It's great, it's charming. It really helps you to uh, understand her as an artist and as a person. Uh, but I, I hope you can see how much is implied in there and that it is actually an act of resistance. It really is, and we need to, to respect that. And it is, of course, always funny. It is funny. Air tang, air tang is funny. He thinks it's funny. She knows it's funny. We all know it's funny, but that funniness only comes from difference. And if we can't laugh while at the same time understanding that the underpinning of that laughter is societal oppression, linguistic oppression, racial oppression, regional oppression, uh, then we're just not being honest. So, oh yes, and also, <laughs> I don't know what this has to do with anything, but she pronounces future as furchus, which is, I just, I, I, I rewind it like 20 times. So, there is my little essay on the importance of regional vernacular in hip-hop music, its greater socio-political meanings. You know, if you never read Langst Langston Hughes, as far as poetry goes, you know, he was really pushing the bounds of this. Uh, I'll, I'll read you one of his poems here, too just to kind of give you an idea. Uh, uh, N-word. Comes home from work, jostle of fur coats, jostle of dirty coats, jostle of women who shop, jostle of women who work, jostle of men with good jobs, jostle of men with the dishes. A Negro comes home from work, wondering about fur coats, dirty coats, white skins, black skins, good jobs, ditches. A man comes home from work, knowing all things, belong, to the man who becomes men. 
It's called Man Into Men. And uh, that's just one of the many poems that he writes. And it's not like he didn't know how to write in more standard English, but he understood the power and the importance of communicating in that way. So if you like this, smash the like bucket. AVAA is how you tell me. Awesome video, as always. Uh, I will heart any comment that says that. I'm really passionate about this review. Like I'm like really excited just because I, I, I just, I wanted to share that. I've, I've had that Baldwin thing in my head for a while and I'm a linguist, you know, and, and like sociolinguistics is super important. So let's get the conversation going. So let me give you a brief review of the album. It, it rules. There's a couple of bad songs, but it's really good. It's really, it's fun because I'm right now teaching my lesson on women uh, in 90s hip hop. So I, I gave a lesson today on Foxy Brown, Lil' Kim, um, where you know, I talked about the importance of eating pussy. It was beautiful. Um, uh, Lauren Hill and Missy Elliott, right? And Foxy Brown, I think I said, yeah. So it's great because, you know, there's all these archetypes that women can fit in in hip hop in general. There's the, the fly girl, the sex kitten, the Nubian princess. Uh, and then part of what's been great is that these archetypes are kind of broken and you can be sort of all these things kind of all at once. And that's sort of what a lot of these new rappers are is they get to be a lot of these things at once. Uh, the sex part has to be up front for a lot of them, as it is for her at times, but not everything. I mean, the opening track, Yeah Glow, it's a big hit. It just rules. It's like a bouncy hit with a cool 808 uh, cowbells, but it reminds me a lot of Crunk, which is just a great m movement, you know? It was a great artistic movement that gave a lot of energy. And this cool kind of like Memphis style, I guess it's a Memphis style, these chopped up voices repeated over and over and over again. I hate on the, the B word, but they stole the flow. Her voice is clear and cool. Despite the accent and everything, her flow is very clear. Before I let a hoe play me, I'll go eat some jail food on gang. The way she says on gang, I thought she said on gunt. So I thought gunt was a cross between God and the most vulgar word for female genitalia. So I'm like, damn, that's a hard expression, on gunt. So you can also put that, you put that in the comments, put on gunt, and I'll also heard <laughs> that. At one point she said, I'm standing on penis in these Chanel shoes. I'm like, wow, that's like a kind of a weird kinky velvet underground, shiny, shiny, shiny boots of leather. I think she's actually saying stand on business. Uh, as opposed to stand up in this. But that's part of the other fun with this uh, non-standard English is that we have all these interpretations. All There is a great, you know, I don't really love stripper songs, you know, because, um... anyways, uh, I, I, uh, I, I once dated somebody who wanted to go to a strip club and uh, I, that's not really my thing. I'm like, okay, fine. And she's like, all right, well, get some stripper music together. And so I'm like, all right. And so I load up my, <laughs> load up my phone the new playlist and I play Skin Tight by the Ohio Players, which I thought was like the ultimate stripper song. Uh, <laughs> she was like, what the hell is this? Uh, All There is a proper stripper song. All about, you know, she deserves hundreds, not ones. But what I like is that it's a sympathetic, it's not really about her, it's about sort of like glorifying strippers and their beauty and their power and their capacities. I'm not going to get into the weeds of the feminist discourse around strippers and positive and negative and commercialization and <sighs> transactional sex and all that stuff. That's, that's an issue. But this song has filled lots of good messages, like don't be ashamed of that cellulite which I think is great. And it's fun. And sometimes I learned after that experience, you just want to, you just want to listen to music that's good in strip clubs. <laughs> Although, Skin Tight by Ohio Players. Have you ever heard that song? Skin Tight. None of them. This is the song where that comes from. Uh, it's got this whole repetition of something, N-word, something, N-word, something, N-word. But the way she pronounces it, it's like, it's, sorry, I'll turn off my, uh, it's like, it's like, you know, they say like the racist way is with a hard R and then the gangster rap way is with an A. This is with like a UH. I'm not going to say it, except I will say that I did translate that line back there and then actually does have an N word in it. So I, I suppose technically video, but that's the complexity of all of these questions, right? Because at what point does the word become so deformed from my mouth? that I don't even know I'm saying it. Man, wait. Man, that boy is not for everybody. That N-word is no virgin. 
Manaf boy for Eba Danigo Bersh. That's how it comes across. No be. Nice chopped up sound here. Simple rising notes, kind of bouncy, kind of crunky. Nice low horn, sustained. I, I, I like this idea of, of her saying that she's not a B word, but all these other men are B words. It's not, she's not the first person to kind of play around with gender like this, but I like it. Wanna Be, that's one of the songs of the year with Megan Thee Stallion. It's just that full crunk feeling, low bass tones, two minor notes, just minor, major, minor, major. And just the interplay between them, I mean, okay, Gloverilla is great, but Megan Thee Stallion is such, I mean, she really steals the show on this. She is such a good rapper. I'm just reminded every time I hear her, her verse is just so good. And the way that she weaves with Glorilla, it's great. Great chorus too, White Boy Wasted, Channing Tatum, just great. You know, great punchy chorus. And this whole theme, don't save her, she doesn't want to be saved, don't keep them. Uh, he doesn't want to be kept. All these themes about like, we're always trying to save women or always trying to keep men, whatever it is, like we should just try to have some kind of relationship of freedom and stop trying to force it. It's beautiful. Off shit, that's that song where, um, where uh, uh, she is in love with uh, a guy who is her op. So her cousin killed his brother. So that's that kind of Romeo and Juliet thing but like with ops where it's not like, it's not, it's not as simple as the, the jets and the sharks or the Capulets and the Montagues or even the bloods and the crypts. It's just like random sets. I, I don't know what. Ha Ait? Aite? A little too pop. This is where the album took a little bit of a turn for me. I mean, her charisma keeps on going. I like that she raps about peace between female rappers. Uh, just pray one day these bad B words would come together because Cardi and Nikki on a track would break some effing records. You know, it's true. It's nice. I talked about that in my class today. Uh, bad B for ya. Uh oh. Heavy metal guitar. Bad. Always bad. Always bad. Always bad when you have heavy metal guitar on a rap album. I dare you. I double dog dare you. Tell me one good rap song with a cheesy ass heavy metal guitar. It never happens. Just stay away. Did Lil Wayne not teach us anything? Anyways, I do like the line, move in silence like the S in Island. Finesse de Glow, produced by DA Got That Dope. I just mentioned that because he produced an album off the Beyonce album. And she wants to work with Beyonce. So let's hope this happens. Um, I, yeah, this song's nice. I like how this, the sample goes up an octave on her verse. This kind of like chopped up sample in the background. High AF, kind of a low key beat. Um, it's interesting, you know, having Having a, a female singing about being high is a little bit transgressive. Um, I like the, the emphaticness of the second verse, but in general, you know, my opinion on drug, drug usage is just kind of a bummer. A GMFU part two. I don't know GMFU part one, but this was still able to come together. Back and form here, kind of a John Carpentery sing, sing, simple trap sort of. I guess it's a Memphis kind of horrorcore style sound with these bells. And she conjugates. Uh, got me fucked up. Like, like they got me fucked up, you got me fucked up, he got me fucked up, she got me fucked up. It's a full conjugation. Um, <laughs> I, I thought she said, how this hoagie down. And so I thought she was talking about like a sandwich. I think she probably meant something else. And then she ends it by just saying, on gunt, <laughs> over and over again. You know, it's not her f problem for mispronouncing. It's mine for not understanding what I'm listening to. In That Mode is the last song. Sort of reminded me in Hamoud a little bit, uh, thematically, but just sort of talking about our inspiration and I ain't kissing ass, we match in energy. Uh, I like that. Um, too cold to be unthawed and too raw to get fucked over. It's a really strong line. You know, like all the way throughout, she is delivering solid lines with this great vernacular, with this great accent, with a kind of like confidence that isn't also like, I'm the best in the world confidence. It's just sort of like a quiet, strong confidence and that comes through in the interview as well. And I don't know, I just, I just hope that uh, this industry allows her to age <laughs> because uh, I could see, that was the last question I think that, that uh, Shannon Sharp asked her, you know, where do you see yourself in six years? And I kind of saw this look go over her and like, we really need as a culture to allow rappers to age. And we've done a good job of that, but I don't know if we've done a good job of that yet with female rappers, so. <sighs> All right, anyways, <clears throat> these are my Patreons. Uh, they give me money so that I can buy music. 
I don't think I'll buy this album, but I do think I'll listen to it some more because uh, it's really nice. I asked if anyone wanted a specific shout out. Uh, the Rat King Michael and Eric wanted a shout out. So I gave them one. I let that. See, now I'm sitting here and, I, and I'm thinking, you know, should I edit out the time where. Should I edit out the time where I said that word or not? Because it doesn't read as the N word when it's in that context, but it's stated as that N word. I legitimately don't know. So I'll tell you what, you're going to see a version of this video. And I might go back and edit it out. You can do that on, on YouTube. It's a pain in the ass, but you can do it. So either you're watching a version where I do not pronounce this word the way that I would pronounce that word, or I have. So we'll see. Tell me in the comments which one is it? Did I say it or no? All right. Until next time, I hope you enjoyed that little uh, speech. Please read James Baldwin and Langston Hughes. <sighs> There's just so much great stuff to read. So a little time. There's the camera.